And welcome back. We have the great good fortune today to speak to Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, some we've uh, been checking in with regularly throughout this uh, last extraordinary time. He has a new lawsuit, uh, which he has uh, participated. He'll give us some details on that. And the basic um, pedigree of, for Dr. Bhattacharya, he's a professor of medicine at Stanford, research associate at the National Bureau of Economics Research, and a senior fellow at Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. He's the Stanford Freeman Spoli Institute, uh, and that's where he's he, the uh, economic policy research is at. Uh, and his research has focused on economics of healthcare around the world in the past. Though lately he has been uh, preoccupied with some of the excesses of our public health system. So we'll take a little break and get uh, the chance to welcome our friend, Dr. Ba Jay Bhattacharya. Our laws, as it pertain to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying. You go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely. that you hope you're not going to need, but if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z -Pak. The medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites, to COVID-19, the Wellness Company's Medical Emergency Kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC, that is drdrew.com forward slash TWC to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. Was saying, Dr. Bhattacharya, professor of medicine at Stanford, research associate, National Bureau of Economics, uh, just an ex extraordinary pedigree, and one of the authors, if not the author, of the Great Barrington Declaration, which uh, largely, had it been followed, might have uh, <laughs> might have reduced the extraordinary suffering that the excesses of our public health system uh, uh, put in place. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya can be followed on uh, X or Twitter at DRJ, DRJ Bhattacharya, which is spelled B H A T T A C H A R Y A, Dr. J Bhattacharya. Please welcome Dr. Bhattacharya. Welcome back, Jay. Thank you, Drew. Can you give us an update on the lawsuit that you've been involved with as it pertains to the, the I believe it's the Biden versus Missouri? Is it that one? Yeah, it's Missouri versus Biden. It was brought by the Missouri and Louisiana Attorney General's Office, and uh, they asked me to be a co-plaintiff on the on the case. Um, the allegation of the case is that the federal government put together a vast censorship enterprise. Uh, the, a federal judge in the case called it a Ministry of Truth, uh, you know, sort of from Orwell. And what they use yeah. their their <laughs> they use their power. It almost sounds like a conspiracy theory when I say it, but it's, it actually was documented in discovery documents and depositions, and and you know federal judges have signed off on this. So if those listening, this is not a conspiracy theory. So what the federal government did is it 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 took a hit list of censorship that it had sort of generated by by cooperating with like NGOs and, and universities, including Stanford University, of people and ideas that it wanted censored off the internet. A lot of these ideas were ideas that were actually true, but were critical of government policy surrounding COVID. So for instance, the idea that the, the vaccine does not stop you from getting COVID, that was censored. The idea that if you get COVID recovered, that you actually have substantial immunity, well, that, well, that was censored. Uh, sort of idea after idea that was inconvenient for government policy 
they, 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 they developed a hit list for censorship. And then the government went to the social media companies and said, if you don't censor these people and these ideas, well, I mean, that's a really nice company you have there. It would be a shame if something were to happen to it. I mean, and, and by the way, literally a federal judge wrote this Al Capone reference in a decision about this case. Um, so you have, you have a, something that like, should never have been done if you think that the First Amendment actually has any bite. On um, the Missouri versus Biden case, we found, we found this out and the judges have said that the, the federal government needs to stop it. Now, uh, Ministry of Truth is just, is just uh, that is exactly what it, that was like in the Orwellian uh, description of what they were doing. And uh, I, I just, what I don't understand is why people aren't, why 100% of Americans aren't upset about this. That to me is one of the most mystifying parts of this. Why, uh, why everyone isn't just gobsmacked. I mean, I think, uh, so if you listen to the other side, Drew, what, the, what they say is that uh, the American people are easily misled and that social media has weaponized the capacity for people to easily mislead vast numbers of Americans at scale and that therefore what needs to happen is that the government needs to have the power to censor social media or else the lives of people will be in danger. That's, that's the argument on the other side. But think about that for wow. a minute. Essentially, what they're saying is that the American people are stu too stupid to actually say to like understand the, the information they have in front of them to, to seek alternate sources of information. They're they're so stupid that they need the government to silence all these contrary voices. Um, I just don't believe that's true. And I I agree with you, Drew. I don't understand why the American. I don't. I just. I can't believe the American people won't when they finally learn of this. Just reject it at scale. I, I would hope so, although it's weird how, to me, that the people are not just mortified by this. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is it's not just that American, they think the American people are stupid. They, they think they're not capable of managing First Amendment privilege. It literally is, that's the part that to me is is going into a very odd direction. It's like, like no, no, you can't handle the truth. You can't handle, uh, you know, uh, unrestrained discourse. Only we, we, the enlightened, can tell you what you should be exposed to and how you should conduct yourself. I mean, does, I mean, it's, it's like, I... In Maoist China, I, I I doubt they were that explicit with the with the kind of that kind of attitude, right? I mean, it's really shocking. And think about did they did they what did they get right actually during the pandemic? The lockdowns were going to work to stop the disease from going everywhere. The school closures were going to be a good idea Wrong. and actually protect grandma. Wrong. Uh, the, 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 that there's no immunity after COVID recovery. That the vaccines are going to stop Wrong. disease spread. Uh, that there's Wrong. no side effects of the vaccines. I mean, is there Wrong. a single thing they got right, Drew? I just, I mean, so the All hubris right. of it is just shocks yeah. the mind. I mean, and, and this is the power they want. These are the people that want the power to suppress you and me from being able to, to reach people on the public because we're too dangerous for the public to hear. It, it's it it is too much for me. Yeah, I was reading an article somewhere in some, it was like a, it must have been like a Newsweek type post on, on the internet or something. And uh, they were talking about the upcoming vaccine, and uh, and uh, they said something about natural immunity, so called. And I was like, "What is this so so called? How bizarre that they have to put these little twists into everything? Natural immunity, so called. It's like what? That's just what it is. It's in infection and immunity. What the what the hell are we talking about here? So it's really I mean, an, an odd odd time. Go ahead." I mean, it's, you know, we've only known about it for 2,500 years. Maybe it just had the, the message hasn't reached them. The, in the Athenian plague, <laughs> you have Thucydides writing about how they, they basically use people who'd recover from the plague to, to care for the sick. So the, the ancient yeah. Greeks knew about it. I, I guess our CDC just hasn't figured it out, and the, the media certainly has it. Now, uh, J, uh, um, Aaron Cariotti is one of your co-defendants, right? Yes, and, and I read something. Uh, he he keeps everybody kind of a, a, abreast of what's going on there. And uh, you had a new decision that expanded to other agencies. Uh, I, I don't understand why that wasn't part of it to begin with. Maybe you can explain that and what the implication is of these other agencies being uh, pulled in. Yeah, so I've learned way more about the federal court system than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> uh, so I'll try my best to summarize. I imagine. Um, so basically, there was a there was a, a, a lower federal court that de 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 decided 
that the FBI, the State Department, the, uh, uh, the, the CDC, the Surgeon General's Office, and the White House, and a number of other federal agencies had basically violated the First Amendment at scale. Like people inside the department were like pressuring social media to do really nasty things. And they were like creating this hit list for censorship with private public partnerships. Um, the federal judge said, no, you can't do that. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to contact social media in order to induce censorship uh, for legal, legally protected speech. That was then the Biden administration then appealed that to an appeals court, which then modified the ruling and limited it to some extent. And it excluded, for instance, the State Department from that order. It said that mm. the State Department did it, maybe maybe it didn't violate the Constitution. Then the the Biden administration. Then we went to the Supreme Court. They, we appealed to the Supreme Court. Our attorneys then went back to the the district court and said, or the circuit court and said, "Look, you guys made a mistake. What the State Department did clearly falls under your own order regarding the censorship activities." And the recent decision just mm. said, "Yes, you're right. The censorship in also encompassed the State Department." Um, and so that's really what's mm. happened. Uh, the real, the major issue that's still at play, I think, is not whether the government can go and coerce companies to stop uh, to to censor censor people online. Um, that I think every court is going to find is ridiculously against the First Amendment. The real question is, can the government cooperate with NGOs and the universities to create a a a, a sort of hit list for censorship, identify themes that they want censored and people they want censored? That is, I think, still quite a dangerous thing for the government to be able to do. Essentially, they're, they're essentially laundering defamation by having the government imprint saying, oh, yeah, it's good that these people that we declare these people are the misinformers of the world. Um, I think mm. that the government ought not do that, even if it is constitutional. And I hope uh, the courts de agree. declare it unconstitutional. But I think if they don't, mm. then I think there should be legislative action and political action to make sure that, that the government stops doing it. I, I believe me, uh, it won't be long before the very people that are doing it will have that turned against them if this is allowed to continue. This is the problem with the guillotines. They, they, they study your history, everybody. When the guillotines come out, everybody goes on the guillotine. No one is left out. That is just is just how these things go. It's almost mathematical. And I, I guess we just don't, well, you know, Churchill well, I mean, paraphrasing, um, yeah. Uh, I forget the Indian uh, philosopher was the first to have said the, the Asian Indian, who said essentially, you know, those who don't study history are deemed, doomed to repeat it. Doomed to repeat it. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the thing about uh, what's happening here is that free speech is for everybody, really. It, as, and you're absolutely right, Drew. It protects everybody, right? And mm -hmm. okay, yeah, the, the 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 people who push the lockdowns currently have the political power, and they're going to use it to censor people. But that doesn't going to last forever. And do they really want that power in the hands of, of their political enemies? I don't want it in anybody's mm -hmm. hand. It makes absolutely no sense. I don't either. To, yep. I, so, and, and, and I thought, that, frankly, I'm really, the, the shocking part to me has been, I thought this was part of the American civic religion. Like, this is what makes us unique in some ways in the world. We are, like, devoted to free speech almost to a fault. Um, and apparently, yeah. a, a large part of the American public doesn't believe that, or, or at least it's not punishing the politicians that are, that are censoring people. Yeah, it, it it is become distorted uh, by, frankly, the the education system, the university system. I suspect is really how the virus has gotten into the system. And uh, I, 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 you know, I, I've always bring up that there was a you probably heard of a guy named Alexis de Tocqueville, a French Frenchman that came here in 1820, and he pointed out then that although we had the most uh, extreme prescription for free speech uh, memorializing the law, his point was that as an actuality, very little of it could be used because he, he called it the effect of the town square. That if you came up, you stood in the town square and you said something really unpopular, you would hear about it. You'd be, you'd be put down in some way. And so he thought it was an interesting idea, an important idea, but that we had to sort of put our money where our mouth is and, and learn to practice it more, which I think we did. I mean, free speech, you know, the First Amendment became, I mean, people don't know the history of this either. It really became an issue during the First World War when uh, people were speaking out against uh, the draft, essentially, and they were essentially silenced by the government and they were they sued for the right to be able to speak out and there were several other cases i'm no expert in this but in the 20th century the the expression the the meaning of the first amendment has been more explicitly worked out yeah it's been expanded and expanded uh, i mean there's a couple of like uh, incidents that i've i've thought about in this uh, in this context like one is when the printing press was invented 
the the powers that mm. be back then it was it tended to be you know sort of sort of church powers that they thought that the printing press was so dangerous because it then allowed heretical ideas to spread very easily that the, that that the printing press itself yep. needed to be controlled the the yep. modern scientific enlightenment came out of the the rejection of that idea that in fact that we should be allow the printing press to print whatever people want um, because that's going to be better for people even if wrong ideas float around on the other hand right ideas also float around and wrong ideas will lose in the marketplace of ideas um and yep. so you know, it's kind of like there you know we have a new printing press we have this social media that allows people to to talk to others at scale and all of a sudden the powers that be want to control it because they're so scared what people will say to each other they want they want to suppress the second enlightenment from happening well what's and, odd you know, to me it go ahead oh i was gonna say science science requires it too and, and you know this drew i mean because you've, you've been speaking I your whole, whole life entire career if you weren't allowed to speak a lot of ideas that are important to get out in the public and and you know i'll, I'll say but for personally, like I've, I've said a lot of ideas, Mo many, I believe in every idea I'm saying, but I do know that I'm going to sometimes be wrong. Free speech protects sure. me also, because then someone can correct me. And then I can, I can learn, I can like ch change my mind. I mean, it's free speech enables there to be scientific discussion, science, progress and science at all. As soon as you end free speech, science also stops. Well, I, I, I believe it was Henry VIII that really put through one of the draconian laws controlling what could be. Uh, he really thought the printing press was not, it was undermining his government, and uh, he put through some stuff. And what's odd to me is that it's the very people that point, have been my whole life pointing at those excesses of McCarthy and Henry VIII, and oh, oh, we'll never do that again, are the ones doing it now. They're the ones actually pursuing the success. <laughs> Uh, it's it's that weird. Uh, it's so weird to have lived through all that. I, I don't know what to do with it. I accept to hope and pray that there's, that things are shifting and that your case will sort of move things in the right direction. I do think it has been remarkable to see the shift. If, if you'd at, told me that it was, was going to be the American left that was going to embrace this kind of authoritarian power of government, I never would have believed it. Never. Yeah. Never. <laughs> yeah, here we it. are. I never would have believed um, it. I, I've spent most um, of my 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 my. Um, broadcasting life fighting the right they, they were you know on me about all kinds of things all the time things i was right about but but they were on me and then all of a sudden boom, the other side is the one that takes the mantle and good and becomes frankly way more destructive and violent with it than the right ever was it's really it's really shocking um i do think though that there is there this missouri versus biden case opens up the possibility of conversation it, you know it's been interesting to hear uh like i've, I've talked to friends regular friends of mine nor, normie nor, i call them normie friends because they're not involved in any of these fights mm. and they tell me they haven't heard mm. of missouri versus biden on the on the in in, you know, in the newspapers and stuff very much you know the newspapers not. have covered it. The, the new york times <laughs> covered it and it, it's it's coverage of the july 4th ruling saying that this was a ministry of truth basically was that uh, that, that the Biden administration is no longer allowed to suppress misinformation online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Um, but, you know, I think part of it is uh, the press views the social media companies as competition. And mm. if Interesting. You, uh, basically, if the government suppress, is able to suppress social, free speech on social media, it removes a major competitor to the New York Times. Now, now people won't have an alternate source to go to and say, oh my gosh, uh, the New York Times is telling me a lie. Um, they don't like to be criticized online. And the, 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 yeah. the, the supposedly free press, which normally was a bulwark for free speech, has now become something else entirely. I mean, they have become cheerleaders for this kind of a suppression of, of speech online. So back to your uh, comment about free speech and the function of science, how science works. I, I don't know if I'm getting paranoid or if I'm seeing something that's a problem. And it was RFK Jr. that sort of raised my anxiety about this. But I feel like particularly the major medical publications are not publishing the usual back and forth I'm accustomed to seeing in the medical literature. So my question is, is there anything to my paranoia? Are you seeing the same thing? And what is it and what do we do about it? I, I actually am seeing exactly the same thing. In fact, I just published a piece in uh, in this journal, uh, the Economics Journal, where I uh, it basically it it, uh, it documents three major cases during the pandemic where huge 
pieces of science, basically for, uh, one demonstrating, for instance, that the lockdowns weren't particularly effective in protecting elderly populations. One, uh, an, a, a, a second of my own pieces, uh, looking at Sweden, for instance, and, and, a, and, a, and a bunch of pieces by this, uh, this UCSF doctor named Vinay Prasad. Uh, and there's these scientific uh, outlets called called uh, preprint servers, like MedArchive, for instance, or SSRN in economics. Um, what these med what these are supposed to do is allow scientists to communicate with other scientists and other people uh, even before peer review. Normally, there's very little review of these articles because you're not supposed to do this. Is not peer review. It's just here's here's a paper I've written. Please give me comments on this. Find errors. Tell me what's wrong so I can correct it. So I can send it to a journal and it'll be better be able to pass peer review. Right. So it's a way for scientists to talk to each other. In my entire career, I've never had any trouble putting papers in these kinds of places because it's supposed to be open and free. During the pandemic, we couldn't put contra narrative papers into preprint servers. And the you know wow. the journals themselves the journals themselves have been absolutely you're you're I don't think you're wrong I mean they they have published things that are like do you remember the Surges Fear scandal remember this this was like in the Lancet. Lancet Lancet yep yeah so 100%. very early in the pandemic oh yeah it's ridiculous yeah <laughs> insane uh, yeah so I mean just very quickly the story like th there was a there was a uh, the, you remember so the everyone uh, there was a whole uh, brouhaha about whether hydroxychloroquine works uh that that was actually a theory that was brought up because they were it worked in SARS one so a lot mm -hmm. of scientists really early on was like oh maybe it'll work in SARS two President Trump latches onto it says oh so we've cured COVID or something um and of course he was that wasn't he was overstating it but he's the president not a scientist um Mm -hmm. Then immediately the entire scientific community as one says, oh, no, we don't know it works. And then two minutes later in The Lancet, one of the top medical journals, there's a paper published that says, oh, we proved with this massive database of, 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 uh, of, from hospitals that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. Now, I looked yeah. at that paper. I've been working in this kind of analysis of claims data area, publishing what many of my papers are analysis of claims data. I'd never heard of that claims data database that they published with. And so my BS detector went off directly. And I, so I'm like, okay, this can't be right. But, you know, I usually like to try to give scientists and others the, the benefit of the doubt. I'm like, okay, I don't know for certain it's wrong, so I'm not going to say much. But a lot of other scientists who directly knew about this called foul and said, this, this data set is a lie. They've made this entire data set up. And the Lancet then had to retract the the whole paper, proving the hydroxychloroquine doesn't work. They retracted that paper because it was based on a false data set. The egg on the face of the Lancet is like almost an you know I don't know how they 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 like look at themselves. How, why are they still the, one of the most famous medical journals in the world? Um, they they basically passed through peer review something that was essentially political agitprop, you know, propaganda to in order to make Trump look bad rather than actual honest science. And you know we've seen this over and over again during the pandemic. The, and the Surges Fear members, or there, there were four of them. One had like a porn site or something. It was just a crazy group of non-scientists. It was the craziest thing. But I, every chance I get, I hold this up. This this is an annals. Um, let me see if I get that right. There we go. Annals of Internal Medicine that was published in May when I noticed for the first time. Let me make sure. Yeah, May 2023. I keep it on my desk here because it was the first time I saw articles that were not going in one direction. This very now they went backwards a little bit right afterwards, but I at least appreciate they published this. One of them, I will tell you, you'll be surprised to hear the title of this article: Oral Fluvoxamine with Inhaled Budesonide for Treatment of Early Onset COVID. Very positive results. Very positive results. Hmm. Yeah. You would not have seen anything like that in 2021. You would absolutely categorically not have seen it. And in this Actually, same Amber article, uh, but oh, they, ahead, they, 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 yeah. well, you know why they were, the, the other thing they did, the, I thought you were going to mention this in your, in your review of, of the craziness. It, one of the first signs I saw there was really trouble was the Danish mask study. Do you remember that? There was yeah, all this I do, energy. I do oh my that. God, this is, we're going to get the, we're going to get it. We're going to get the data. We're going to show that masks work. It was going to be published, as I recall, as I understood it at the time, New England Journal was on deck to publish it. Then all of a sudden you hear they're not going to publish it. And then JAMA won't publish it. And then Annals publishes it, and it was a negative study, right? And so 
there it is. I mean, that was to me, I would love to know the chain of command of what exactly. I'd love FOIA that for me, please. FOIA what went on there, because I think there, right that discussion, we would find out so much about the craziness here. But, but I, I, and the other thing I've also been aware of was uh, the other Danish study, it's strange how they're coming out of Denmark, uh, about the uh, excess um, adverse event with the vaccine in 10% of the batches in the early days of the vaccine distribution. 90% of the adverse events, 10% of the batches. It took the, that the research group, which was an excellent research group, but an excellent article, sailed through peer review, two years to get that published. And after it was published, crickets from the manufacturer. I, again, I just want to know what what is going on. What are we looking at? A, B, normally, that would that would spin off a whole series of other studies, would it not? I mean, the, in, I remember there was an editor of New England Journal a few years back, Marsha Angel, who wrote this really, really interesting sort of retrospective as she was leaving, essentially talking about the you know pharmaceutical interests that that control the top of medical publishing. Like a lot of, I remember when I was a medical student, the JAMA, every single JAMA uh, our, our sort of magazine would have in it uh, direct ads for pharmaceutical companies, for, for pharmaceutical products. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, there's a lot of pharmaceutical company control over the top medical journals. Uh, that, the, whoever is the editor Capture. of, the, of the, the, yeah, I mean, I think Capture is really important. And, that, and but the, I have to say, yeah. I pray, I have a lot of praise for the analysts. That, it took a lot of guts to publish that Danish mass study, that fluvoxamine study. They were, they were, they were quite good compared to the rest, although they did publish some nonsense. But that's you know, and you know what? Uh, it's did. normal to publish nonsense. It's, no, it's like that's just right. that's just normal even in normal times. So yes, but um, fair but enough. To, and, but, you know, and it's interesting. Annals was I was losing interest in annals before the pandemic. They they were they were getting into weird uh, stuff that really wasn't pertinent to clinical medicine, and now they're they're back. I, lo I love my annals. Um, and you mentioned Vinay Prasad, who I've interviewed a couple times on this program, and and uh, I. Um, I, I I had found him again, like many excellent thinkers. I found him where long before anybody else did. He had this um, podcast, which was really sort of an examination of uh, oncological research, and really thoughtful. He's a great reader of medical literature, and he, <laughs> I feel like they radicalized him a little bit by attacking him because he's been on the war path lately. And I almost <laughs> I smile now when I read his tweets. But do, are you in communication with him at all? Yeah, we're friends. Uh, I mean, I, I've been. Is he actually, okay? Think, is he? <laughs> is is he worry about this stuff the way we do? I mean, he's he just seems like he's fighting a, a, a one man war there. He is. Uh, first of all, he uh, when he started the war, he had, did not have tenure at UCSF. The man is incredibly brave. Like he was speaking up long before. I actually, I think, I, like I, looking back, I think I actually had a paper with him, or like, or there was like some discussion writing a paper together before the pandemic with some other co-authors. So I knew something about mm -hmm. him. But during the pandemic, I, I also discovered his outspokenness and also his clarity of thought and his clarity. Great bravery. So uh, good. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, he knows I'm, I'm what really, he knows. Really, you know what I mean? When when people when people really know their shit, so to speak, they 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 know they know what they know, and they, and they stand by it. And uh, plenary sessions was his podcast, I, and I found it yeah. long before everything went crazy. Um, all right, so we have to take a little break here. Uh, we're here, of course, with Jay Bhattacharya. I, I'm going to let him go at the top of the hour, and then I will take phone calls after that. But I want to get into the vaccine uh, after this little break and uh, talk a little bit about concerns. I I am swimming in. I would call it sort of confusion about the vaccine. There's, I've just got a lot of questions. I keep asking the same questions over and over, not getting much clarity. And and I'm you know talking to lots of different kinds of people to try to get an understanding of these things. But uh, we'll talk about that when we come back. Looking forward. Fall is right around the corner, which means dry, flaky red skin from allergy season is coming with it. But the best way to take care of your skin is with our skincare secret, Genucel. You don't need to worry about that puffy, tired eye look or those annoying dark spots or even dry, flaky skin because Genucel skincare has you covered. Susan and I love our Genucel products so much, we want you to try our personally curated skincare bundles. It's risk-free at genucel.com slash Drew. Genucel works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. Their concentrated vitamin C serum helps keep your skin plump and hydrated. Plus, with their immediate effects, you can see astonishing results in under 12 hours. 
Quick, effective, and easy. Go to genucel.com slash Drew right now to try our bundles and save over 60% today. And remember to enroll in Genucel's world-class concierge program for additional savings and free shipping. Don't wait. It's genucel.com slash Drew. G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. There are three reasons the central banks are dumping the U.S. dollar. Inflation, deficit spending, and our insurmountable national debt. The fact is, there is one asset that has withstood famine, wars, political and economic upheaval, dating back to biblical times, gold. And you can own it in a tax shelter retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. That's right, Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k maybe from a previous employer, into an IRA in gold. And the best part, you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Just visit birchgold.com slash Drew for your free info kit. They'll hold your hand through the entire process. Think about this. When currencies fail, gold is a safe haven. How much more time does the dollar have? Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. I do not give financial advice, and previous performance is no guarantee of future performance. Visit birchgold.com slash Drew to get your free info kit on gold. That is B-I-R-C-H-G-O-L-D dot com slash D-R-E-W. These products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. Discover the key to oral hygiene, regardless of your current daily dental routine. Whether you diligently brush and floss multiple times a day or you struggle, you got bleeding gums, bad breath, plaque buildup. This revelation is for both of you. Surprisingly, over 350,000 Americans experience health issues that may be connected to their toothbrush or even caused by it, ranging from heart or blood sugar problems, forgetfulness, digestive difficulties, immune issues, all related to oral hygiene. Scientific studies have shown that a simple switch of your toothbrush can lead to a healthier teeth and potentially save your marriage. Yes, save your marriage. Our study, we did a personal study. My wife, Susan, hates the sound of the sonic toothbrushes, but introducing the real white sonic toothbrush, of course, also their hydroxyapatite dirty mouth mineral toothpaste by Primal Life Organics, these products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. It's much quieter. It's a very powerful toothbrush, but it is quiet and it saved our marriage. So... The Real White Sonic Toothbrush from Primal Life Organics stands out among all other electric toothbrushes I've tried. It effectively eliminates plaque, harmful bacteria, promotes gum health. Get yours and enjoy 60% off at naturaltoothbrush.com slash D-R-E-W. And we are back. We're here with Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford University. Um, how's, the, how's the sort of... Uh, ambient temperature at Stanford these days? Are, are, do you take grief for the Great Barrington Declaration? Are people sort of coming around in some way? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to gauge where we're headed here uh, as, a, as a profession and as a country. I mean, it's it's a little unsettled, I have to say. I, I don't take grief anymore, I don't think. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, it was a hostile work environment. Like, I, I couldn't, uh, there was yeah. like at one point in 2021, I couldn't walk around campus. Someone had done a, a poster campaign trying to terrorize me, uh, accusing me of killing people in yeah. Florida or something, even though Florida has had lower oh, all-cause deaths than California. Um, but, yeah. uh, and the, you know, the, the, the administration uh, switched over. There's a new president. Um, and the, the new president seems a little more open to academic freedom. Uh, we'll see is, I guess, what I'd say. I, I, I do think that a lot of the people that got the pandemic wrong, uh, are very prominent people here are still here at Stanford, and that you know they haven't publicly said that they got it wrong, um, but they but they did. Mm. I think they know it. Um, there's a lot. Of, there's a big fight now over that Missouri versus Biden case that we opened with. Uh, it has a Stanford angle because the Stanford Internet Observatory is part of this network of group of people and organizations mm. that give the federal government its marching orders for which which people to censor. Uh, I mean, so there's quite the, there's a possibility that this group actually recommended that I, the ideas that I was espousing be censored during the pandemic. Um, and so like there's going to be there's this brewing fight on campus over well, do they have a free, a academic freedom right to like to to, to document this free speech, this this these these like the censorship regime, do, or uh, or mm. are they violating other people's free speech by doing this? Uh, I mean, I, I, my position is the government ought not be funding that kind of effort. If some Correct. professor wants to go and analyze the internet, fine, I don't really care. But they shouldn't be given an yeah. in via this government funding to essentially t telling social media companies what and who to censor. Agreed. So let's get into the vaccine a little bit. Um, 
I have many, many, many weird concerns. Uh, l- let me just ask this uh, start question. Um, it seems like the the push for the vaccine has never changed. It's it's been it's been one sort of note the whole way. And in the meantime, we're sort of looking at data that suggests that the adverse, significant adverse events of note rate in this vaccine may be on the order of 1 in 800. This is Dr. Freeman's data versus 1 in 10,000 or 1 in 100,000 that usually results in vaccines being pulled. So that's one side of my big question mark over my head. The other part of the question mark over my head is what I'm seeing clinically. Clinically, I have seen all the way along my elderly patients benefit from the vaccine, and I've seen almost no side effects. Now, they've all still gotten COVID. And, you know, the, one of the things that is, again, another odd thing about the vaccine discussion, we have Paxlovid. We have it. It works. What, why are we so focused on this vaccine when it doesn't prevent COVID? It doesn't prevent transmission maybe prevents hospitalization, but then so does Paxlovid. And why, why are we so pushing so hard on the vaccine? Now, my elderly patients, I generally back, backs and boost, and lately I've been starting to, and I have them take the RSV vaccine, and, and I've seen almost no side effects. In 30, 40, and 50-year-olds, I have seen a ton of side effects, very concerning side effects. And I'm not clear what benefit they've gotten because they were young. I don't understand what, and again, we have Paxlovid. We can use it. It's not been approved for that group, but we can use it. Why why has there not been any adjustment when we now understand this thing has more adverse events of note than, than we usually tolerate, and we have other therapeutics in place, and the younger people, risk reward is questionable, why push on the young people the way they're pushing? And by the way, my understanding is we're only one of two countries in the world that vaccinate under 50 or push the vaccine under 50. So have at it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the Scandinavian countries won't, won't even let you have access if you're, if you're younger. Um, I, I think uh, if, <laughs> this is a hard question to answer because now we're talking about, uh, I think a lot about is, is, is both, both, both financial interests, but also ego. Right. So, has, think it, about has anything actually, I said? Does any? But let me ask you this: it, it, Did anything I say run afoul of the facts, or your understanding of things, or your experience clinically of things? I mean, am no. I am I wrong in some material way? Because that's what worries me—that I'm getting it wrong somehow. Because there's so no, much I, stuff I, lying around, and I have my clinical impressions, which are what they are. They're just what I'm seeing. So, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I I know I, I agree with you. I I think that the vaccine was a a, a very good thing on net for older people. I, I do, I do mm-hmm. worry a little that there may have been some side effects in older people, but I think that the whatever expected so harm there was was more than offset by the reduction in mortality risk provided to patients who were older who had to face well, substantial course. risk from COVID. Yeah. So I agree yeah. with that. I also agree with you that in younger people, and this is based on my my reading of of the Freeman study, which was an excellent reanalysis of the randomized evidence on these vaccines, on the mm-hmm. mRNA vaccines, mm-hmm. um, and that in young people that there it, it, there's that the uh, rate of serious adverse events is high, uh, in and not only is it high, but it's not offset by a corresponding benefit in terms of the reduction in mortality because young people don't face a very high risk of mortality from COVID in the first place. So, so, like, so for instance, I've seen some like wrong, like discourse, very wrong-headed discourse, trying to compare myocarditis from the vaccine versus myocarditis from COVID in young men. The problem with yeah. that analysis is that the vaccine doesn't stop you from getting COVID, so uh, it, it means that you have two draws on the myocarditis, you know, sort of slot machine: one uh, from the vaccine and another from COVID. Uh, you're not; you, it's an additive risk, not a substitutionary risk. Uh, so, so it's one of these things where like. There's this like narrative around the vaccines that has pushed the uh, the 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 idea that everyone should get it almost from the beginning of the of the uh, the, the rollout of the vaccine, with this false idea that if everyone gets the vaccine that, that everyone gets the vaccine then COVID goes away. Now that's not right. true. That hasn't been true, and we've known it's not true for a long time. And yet our uh, regulators in the United States don't seem to be able to give up that idea. At now, but now what they've reached the stage is like they're saying, well, yeah, uh, we think we should get the, the this you know, booster number six or whatever it is, um, and everyone should get it. But the only reason we're saying everyone should get it because it's we want to simplify the messaging. 
they've they reached this point where they no longer actually try to justify it as reducing transmission or, or stopping transmission. Uh, they'll, they'll say, look, it reduces your risk of hospitalization and death, and uh, therefore you should get it for everybody, even six month old babies. Um, I just don't, I don't, I don't really understand it. The public can understand nuance. They can say, oh, okay, if you're older, uh, you, it, the, the vaccine might be right for you. Go talk to your doctor about it. If you're younger, you probably don't need it unless you have some, you know, some uh, you know, pre-existing condition or something that, may, that predisposes you to bad outcomes. Um, then still go see your doctor and ask them. That would be the, it, it's a nuanced way to deal with it. And it tells patients to go get information from their own provider who cares for them. I don't understand why they didn't just do that. Yeah. From the beginning, I don't understand why they didn't do that. But yes, I, I I completely agree with you. But is it possible? I was I again. I whenever I talk to you, I, I try to examine alternative points of view that I I might be missing. I, I am I am I missing something about pediatric COVID and MS you know, MIC and the you know multi system inflammatory syndrome and or am I, MISC rather? Am, am I missing? I, am, what am well, I missing? I, I, I can't. No, I know, and I can't, and I just can't get my head around. I'm trying, 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 and then the real push on pregnant women. So much push there. I, I, I don't get it. And we did it. We did a thing yesterday talking about the menstrual irregularities associated with the vaccine. I was very dismissive of that at one point, just going, yeah, you know, women, you, you know, everything affects menstruals, and we shouldn't worry about it so much. But it's, it's, it's really bothering people, and we don't know. Could it also affect fertility? Or what the women are starting to report is, look, if you're a, if you're a, for instance, a uh, Orthodox Jew, you're not allowed to try to conceive if this is going on, and it's affecting conception that way. I, I, I don't think about these things, but, but it's all dismissed as, oh, blah, 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 come on now, just take take the vaccine. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the, 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 for a lot of groups, a lot of these like reports. That, that that were originally like conspiracy theories turned out to be true. Like the the, the effect on menstruation yes. turns out to be true. Yes. I mean, absolutely true. The myocarditis on young yeah. men. I mean, I think the evidence on that. Anyone that denies it doesn't know how to read the medical literature at all. Um, you know, there's there's yeah. a lot of concerns about the vaccine and and you know legitimate concerns about the vaccine. I, I think you know, but there's also a, I think I, okay. Let me just try to address the, the the sort of like the the counterfactual that you're you're trying to put in front of me. Yeah. Uh, or the re reasoning. Yeah. Like, so one. Um, like think about why, uh, think about like the fear that people were put into during the pandemic, during their, especially the early stages of the pandemic regarding this yeah. disease. Oh yeah. There's still, yeah. there's still a substantial portion of the, po of the population, very like, not, not, a, not much, not as much as it was in 2020 or 2021, but also some people that are very scared about the disease. And for them, the idea that a vaccine is going to allow them to be safe is quite comforting. And I think the the uh, CDC and others are, are sort of, they're catering to that audience. Um, the, and the second piece, and this really this is something we haven't really discussed, but I think it's a very important part of the, the, the puzzle. Um, the, there's a tremendous amount of money at stake here in the vaccines, uh, both because, of course, the pharmaceutical companies are making a tremendous amount of money, especially, ph especially Pfizer and Moderna, from the sale of these vaccines and boosters to, to the governments. Um, but also because, you know, I know there are liability shields, but a lot of a lot of places required people to get the vaccine. Colleges required their students to get the vaccine. Yes. What if what if they'd had what if they what if a kid has myocarditis as a as a consequence of the vaccine they didn't want to take that they had to take us to go to school? A lot of these yes. these non pharmaceutical companies are are scared because what if they're liable for that? There's going to be lawsuits around this, Drew. There's going to be for sure. And I think a lot of this well, is good. just like trying to. Yeah, I know, I know, it is good, but it should be. If they're trying to cover their cover themselves, they're still trying to like figure out some way out of this trap that they built for themselves, and it's really the American public that's suffering as a result. Um, Susan just ran in here. You don't hear. There's somebody like hammering downstairs, and it's uh, go, coming through on everything here. Not, it's it's incredible. I don't hear it. Yeah, I just stop. But go downstairs. Somebody, either there's an animal stuck in a room or something. Or I don't know what it is, but there's horrible banging. I didn't hear it. I'll go so, look. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I wonder why those suits haven't happened already. And you know what's other other interesting, back to your point about the myocarditis, the vaccine. I was looking at, um, I forget the guy's name I was talking to yesterday, um, but he had some data. He was showing data on vaccine adverse events and he had the, the cardiac data and i looked at it and it was broken down into about 10 different categories all secondary to myocarditis right so 
atrial fib, atrial flutter, ventral ventricular arrhythmias, all sorts of arrhythmias that are now well known to be related to the scarring left over from focal myocarditis. And so literally, oh, here's the list. So it's atrial fib, irregular heartbeat, myocarditis, of course. Uh, failure, I'm going to, well, that's myocarditis. Cardiac arrest, maybe myocarditis. Pericarditis, of course, same, similar thing. Cardiac flutter, myocarditis. Ventricular extrasystole, myocarditis. Cardiomegaly, myocarditis. Cardiac respiratory arrest, that's a back to the sudden, sudden death category. Why they broke it down like that is odd to me. But all those things are caused by myocarditis. All those things. I mean, I think there's no question that this has too high a side effect rate in young men to warrant a recommendation that any young man take this vaccine. I don't understand how they can look at data like this or similar data, or just even just the frame and et al. data and say, look, okay, yeah, young men take this vaccine. It just, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Or, or six month old babies take this vaccine. No benefit and potential harm. So why would you require it? Um, I don't know, uh, Drew, have you been tracking this really interesting set of results on um, on on the the, uh, the the contamination of the vaccine, in the mRNA vaccines with DNA plasmid? Plasmids. Plasmids. Yeah. So, so here's McCurney. my question on plasmids. I was going to bring that up now. So the head of and the dean of the uh, oncology department at Brown raised this issue today. Uh, so he, and his question was, and this is my question, yes, there are manufacturing controls to address plasmid contamination. Yes, there are intracytoplasmic mechanisms to cleave the plasmids. Yes, you need some sort of mechanism to get the plasmid into the nucleus. Those are all three things I understand are true. But is... Our previous manufacturing standards prior to the advent of LNPs appropriate to a system that is designed to fuse with the cell surface and get its contents into the cell at high volume. In other words, is our tolerance for a certain amount of plasmid contamination inappropriate for the for the LNPs? Is that is that really is that getting to the crux of the matter? That's what I've been thinking about. That that is that's that's one issue that's incredibly important. So the the manufacturing standards to which the the, the the you know Pfizer and Moderna are subject by the FDA are based on non lipid nanoparticle delivery mechanisms of the plasmid. Now this is not right. my expertise. I've been, right. been I've been trying to like educate myself also on this, but that I think yes. is the, the crux of the, of the question. Is is this novel delivery mechanism different from the other mechanisms on which the old regulatory standards were based? And Correct. How, we don't have an answer to that question. If I can, if I'm, if I'm reading the evidence correctly, we don't know the answer to that question. Maybe the old regulatory standards I, I, are fine. Maybe they're not. Yeah, but maybe they are because there are some interests. There are some. There are some mechanisms in the cell to deal with plasmids. I mean, we have those things. But who's? Do, where is the study? Where is the FDA? Where is yeah, the research? Where is the, what, and 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 now I have oncologists raising concerns about it. That this could be. This could do something. If, if you know, you could see how it could do something. <laughs> That that okay, so why the, isn't that an emergency? There's a second thing that uh, that I've heard from Kevin McKernan say, which is really interesting, actually. And again, I don't know the studies that that they're like. And I, what he what he brings up is that if you have a process of manufacturing where these kinds of like fra plasmid fragments remain in as contamination in the sample, well, the plasmid yeah. fragments are based on on like you know essentially you infect bacteria. The bacteria you give the plasmid, then the bacteria then produce the the the, the product that you want to introduce into the body, and then you you right. you cleanse the, the 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 solution of the the uh the, you know the bacteria's the you know, cell walls and all the all the endotoxins bacteria has and the plasmid yeah. all together, and you give the purified yeah. mRNA product to the to the patient, right? Um, right. But if the plasmid yeah. contamination is there. Maybe there's also endotoxin contamination from the bacteria that were used to manufacture the mRNA, and right. the uh, and the and right. so like I don't know. I mean, I mean, this is something that Kevin McKernan raises. I, I, I've looked question? at, I've seen, I've seen some data on the manufacturing standards for endotoxin, and and, and I think that's going to end up being a nothing. Uh, I, I think, I hope, I, 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 uh, but because because it really doesn't have the same concerns that the plasma delivery would have with the LNP, right? Uh, it's a concern and it needs to be, you know, somebody needs to address it straight away and 
prove that it's not a problem. But I, I suspect that one's going to go away. But the plasma thing, I, I don't know how you do the studies. I don't know what you do, really. I Because I, I'm asking lots of questions now, like, where can I find a data to push back on this concern? I'd like to be able to push back on it. Everyone just talks about intracytoplasmic mechanisms that are known to cleave plasmids. Well, uh, okay, yeah. There are lots of things that we find out once we deploy a drug in humans that end up not to be at all the way we thought they were. You had to, right. why you do phase three trials. That is the key point that I wanted I wanted to, to say here, and you you hit it exactly right, Drew. Um, the The problem here is is a clinical question. What does all this matter, right? Um, now the the trials that were run, the the large forty thousand plus patient trials that were run by Pfizer Moderna in twenty twenty. They were run using a manufacturing process that didn't have this plasma contamination problem. And so the serious adverse events, the adverse events that, for instance, the Freiman et al. paper measured were based on this other sort of more, more rigorous manufacturing process that didn't have this contamination. The, the vaccines that were deployed at scale were, used, were based on this other second process based where, where the plasma contamination actually happened. So we don't really have randomized trial evidence of the sort that Freiman et al. produced on the serious adverse events for this process. Yep. Yep. And so yep. we're left in it the could dark. Be totally different. And, I, what I, and so, like, and this is a, an utter failure on on the part of our regulatory agencies. Our regulatory agencies it gave like Pfizer and Moderna the green light to go ahead, even though. They knew that the Pfizer and Moderna were going to use this separate, distinct process that had the potential to have contamination, plasma contamination. And so we're sitting here, we're having a discussion. We're sitting here this having discussion, trying to suss through what well, what are the consequences of it. And we're like thinking about theoretical mechanisms by which the nucleus or or the cell cytoplasm might cleave the plasmid. But I don't. That is not enough for me. To say to a pay, to someone, uh, well, yeah, you should take this. I know that this can, whatever contamination is isn't going to do you any harm. I don't. I would love to have phase three randomized evidence that allows me to say that with confidence. Yes. And no doctor can look yes. that patient in the eye and say that with confidence. Now, I don't, and that's not the fault of the doctor. That's the fault of the regulatory agency that didn't hold Pfizer and Moderna to account and require them to produce yep. the data that would have allowed doctors to answer these kinds of questions. Yeah, and so informed consent becomes something that is essentially impossible. Essentially impossible because I and this I've been saying that all along. I, I it, look, I don't know how you give an informed consent for the use of Paxlovid in a forty-year-old because the studies were all done on a sixty-year-old, a sixty-year-old and above. And and I have some experience. And I can talk about that, and I can hold you know sort of you know sort of monkey some informed consent and same thing with the vaccine i i would have to bring up the adverse events i've seen and the one in 800 versus one in ten thousand. you know uh circumstances for for uh, pulling a vaccine I, I i know what we do i and certainly none of us are doing it in writing which we're supposed to do uh which is kind of interesting in and of itself uh jay i know you have to go at the top of the hour we're right up against things here is there anything uh i have left out there's been a lot of fun as always well, I think I'm really glad that that we still have free speech, so we can have this conversation that's inconvenient to the administration and to the the, the, the pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot from you over the years, uh, Drew, and I think I'm really grateful for that. I think if um, if there's one thing I would leave the audience with, if you can talk to your congressman, you can talk to write a letter to your senator, tell them that mm. you you are appalled at this con that this, con this control of free speech this is not just something that affects doctors it affects basically every single mm. american and it's vital that you know i've i've testified in congress on this issue and my own congresswoman basically poo pooed my concerns about the free speech you know i, I live in the you know very liberal part of the bay area um, and it was it was actually shocking to me like i thought everyone agreed let every they they ought to agree our congress people ought to agree with this uh, let every let every, yeah. your Congress people, your representatives, all know that censorship is not right. You don't want you to be protected from misinformation mm -hmm. by them. What you want is a free exchange of ideas, so and for the government to treat you like an adult that you are. Yes, agreed, and uh, I second that uh, motion, so to speak. Please write those letters. Now, Jay Bhattacharya, follow him on Twitter, drj Bhattacharya. Uh, let's see, is it spelled out there somewhere? So I don't have to try to do it off the top of my head. B H A T T A C H A R Y A. Every third letter is an A. So, and, and the other thing is, uh, my, my cousins think I don't know how to pronounce my own last name. So you can't 
mispronounce it either. So it's all it's all good. It's all good. Okay, okay fair enough. All right, my oh, there it is up there on the screen. Now I'm seeing it. Uh, all right, thank you, my friend. We'll hopefully talk to you very soon if we can do anything to help support you with your. Um, um, Missouri versus Biden uh, endeavor. I, I read Cariotti's stuff as he puts it out, so I get the updates there, but uh, please let us know. Thank you, Drew. Real grateful to talk to you. All right. You, yeah, you as well. Uh, one of my uh, favorite interviews, I, I've said all along that he it will be the, when this history books are written, he'll be the poster child for the excesses of uh, COVID in that, that you see what a substantial, thoughtful, reasonable person this is that's who they thought it was should be censored that's who they thought they got a censor so it's just uh, beyond me um, there was no noise outside maybe they brought the trash can back would it have been that you, oh i hear that you don't hear that oh it's banging the it's ridiculous it's it's i think it's down it's it's so loud maybe it's just the woodpeckers no that is not woodpeckers Susan. I heard it now. I just don't. Okay. I went outside. I didn't see anything. So. It's it's either in, it's one of the bedrooms around here. <laughs> I, I guarantee you it's a door. Uh, somebody's get, locked in a door? Th something uh -oh. like that. Yeah, where's Georgina? Well, they, oh. she, she could be. <laughs> Let me go see. She may be locked in a door. Hold on. Yeah, I mean, it's a hell of a sound she's making, if that's it. All right, I want to take some calls here, um, if you guys don't mind. Uh, in order to uh, bring you up here, just raise your hand. Uh uh, Caleb played the cartoon there and how you do so you just request and then I'll bring you up and uh, if I do bring you up you'll be streaming on multiple platforms um, Christy had talked to me earlier about coming up so I am inviting you to speak if you'd like to um, let's see that it's not you know Caleb the invite to speak button is not working that well you know what I'm saying I'm trying to see if I can I'm gonna see if I can do it from here if she doesn't come up okay she was okay, just there, not working. and then it she disappeared. It, and then there she, she is. Just, there she She's is. coming again. in. And watch you. All right. All right. I have a new Christine, phone. How's it going? There. there you go. Any uh, Anything you want to talk about today? Is Dr. Bhattacharya still there? No, he had to go at the top of the hour, so it's just us. He had to part ways. All right. Is there anything you wanted to talk yeah. about? Well, he brought up things that you have been concerned about for quite some time. Uh, I just uh, didn't know if, it, and, and Caleb mentioned that you had wanted to speak today about something, and so I brought you up. I was out jogging, and I wasn't listening to the show, and I literally just ran in the door. And yeah, I've had concerns about the plasmids, of course, like everyone else. And that, you know, I know Dr. Buckholtz is talking about the, you know, the possibility of mutations, you know, is it going to be rare? Uh, there, there's a concern that I have on the plasmids that is a section of it, a large section, even if they're in pieces, is the same, of course, that is in bacteria and that human bodies can recognize that innately and the immune system mm -hmm. can react to it. So a few of us behind mm -hmm. the scenes, some doctors and scientists were worried, you know, is, is this also you know, what's going on if it gets in people's cells and then if the immune system right. launches an attack, is it a sustained attack due to that and not not only the spike? Mm, interesting. And uh, is there going to be some more data coming soon or we have anything to report on the horizon? <clears throat> as soon as I know, I will send you a message immediately. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Yep. Well, thank you so yeah, much. We, we appreciate the updates and stuff. And, Sorry, uh, that's all can, I got. It's, oh, it's all good. Uh, uh, Caleb, you said she'd wanted to come up, right, today? Yes, I, I saw uh, a tweet so from her, so I, I thought that she had something that she wanted to come in, like an emergency uh. to share. So <laughs> I just assumed that. Found she always has something banging. interesting. There was, was the dog. there was a dog locked in a bedroom. She was oh, pounding really, on the door. Really pounding, like really. Yeah, she, she does not like being locked in. So ridiculous. Happens a lot. Was that downstairs? She follows me around everywhere, and then I shut the door. I don't know if she's in a room. Was that downstairs? No, in Douglas's room. Oh, that's why it was so loud. We were in there like maybe half hour ago. Well, that whole time I've been texting you. An hour ago. <laughs> like listening to this. Sorry. I, I had a feeling that might be it. The woodpeckers. <laughs> uh, Alex, I'm trying to get you up here. It's not connecting, and this seems. We to do be have a... woodpeckers, though. I know that. They I, sound like I, that in the morning. Not like that. Uh, all right, that didn't work. 
Um, this is Truth Seeker <laughs> raising her hand. But he said, how many dogs has Susan murdered? <laughs> <laughs> well, she was left in a room for a really long time a couple of weeks ago, and she was not happy. Mm. Hi, Truth Seeker. Hi, Dr. Drew. Thank you for having hey me there. up. I'm just going to do a little shameless plug here. So Dr. Fauci mm. is actually here in the Bay Area uh, he was speaking in San Mateo last night, and we had a peaceful rally, and today he was, he's going to be in Marin. So we're doing a second uh, peaceful rally. Uh, we're just uh, exercising our free speech. So if anyone wants to come and check that out and join us, um, I have the information pinned to my profile. And I'm sorry, I was screaming a lot okay. last night. I actually okay. saw him and called him out. <laughs> so I'm losing my voice um. from last night. So it wasn't really peaceful. It's, it's, her <laughs> well, Twitter it was handle peaceful, is but also, <laughs> I did call it's, him a liar. Hang on, it's S A S A R. Sorry, it's S A R I T A J R twenty four. Truth Seeker yes. twenty four. S A R I T A J R. Uh, all right. Well, uh, and this is against mandates. Your your concern is right. Correct. Yes, we've been speaking out against the mandates. I live here in the Bay Area, and uh, we've been holding rallies for the past three years since the start of COVID. So there's a lot of us out here that are, are speaking up here in California. Which reminds me, speaking of California, I'm going to be, um, uh, what do you call it when you, uh, not moderating, hosting, but uh, moderating. moderating, thank you, moderating a panel with RFK Jr. in San Jose and when is that, Susan? The 26th or something of October? October 28th. And, uh, I just saw that on Children's Health 20... Events. 28th. Okay, Asim Alhatra. Asim Alhatra will be there. I, I really haven't heard much details about how we're organizing this yet, but apparently it's it's going to be a really interesting group of people, and so I'll be um, very, very uh, you know interested to hear the, the everybody speak, and uh, I'm hoping we'll have discussions that I get to moderate. All right, this is... It's called Reclaiming Food and Medicine, Ending Corruption and Chronic Disease. Oh, Live on, in San Jose. Oh, wait. 10, yeah. 28, 23. That's a Saturday. Yeah. And uh, also Dr. Vandana Shiva will be there as well. She must be the food side of this. Again, I'm not a super... Uh, you know, I'm a moderate in all this stuff, so it'll be interesting to see what I what I think about what you're saying. Aren't there other doctors as there well? There are. There are. Those are the main that have been announced so far. Buck, what's going on there? Hey, Dr. Drew. It's an honor to talk to you. Thank, you. thank you for taking my call. P pleasure. Hey, so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm listening I'm listening to a good, good portion of this, and I watch your show a lot, and there just really doesn't seem to be a lot of positives that are coming from this, from the injection itself. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of concerning factors that are arising. I, I don't hear a lot about the positives. Well, that's the, and, that is the very issue. That's the crux of the matter. If you're 40 years old, how much and what positive do you expect to get from the vaccine in a day and age when everyone's had covid had the vaccine paxlovid is available what are you getting same for kids same well it's a little different but similar similar question if you were 75 look i i recommended i was talking to a 90 year old yesterday and i was encouraging her to get all the way boosted up i'm, I'm ready to go for her because uh, COVID and even with Paxlovid could be curtains. It's a totally different benefit for her than you, a young male. What are you going to get out of a vaccine except possibly being one of the one in 800 people that gets a, a serious adverse event? That's my concern. And that's my, that's constantly the thought bubble over my head. Why pushing so hard on guys like Buck? Why are you doing that? That, well, that's yeah. that's my concern too, and and I guess my last thing that I would want to add here would be, you know, I had a one, one of um, the physicians I work with uh, called me up today and said that they had just been vaccinated and they were you know rifling through their paperwork and you know looking for the name of the vax and you know they're like oh I took spike vax, you know, is is that a little uh, concerning in general that they named it spike vax uh, considering the amount well, of spike, spike is the target <laughs> that's is, the moderna that, vaccine that, yeah i mean that's moderna. i don't know i i think 
Yeah, that, that so that's that is to that is to do what now? That the spike vax is to is to target the spike protein itself. No, no, no. The spike vax is to give you pieces of mRNA to produce lots of spike protein. So your immune system has seen the spike but protein uh, recently and react to it. But haven't we identified that the spike protein is causing problems though? Oh, dude, you're getting at the crux of the matter again. That is that is one of the questions is why did they pick why did they pick the nuclear capsid as the target for this vaccine? Why the spike protein when we know the spike ha at least causes an endotheliitis? So these are yeah. th that will have to be answered in the history books it, because look, it, it as a target, it's a good idea. It works. But in terms of mitigating uh, serious effects I'm not sure it was the best target to pick i'm just saying so yes yeah, your point is well yeah. taken well i, I don't want to take up much more time I, I, yeah i really appreciate you letting me on to speak dr drew uh, it's been an honor I, I've all good questions so, yeah, Thanks, i appreciate Bob. that your, your, your I'll, thinking I'll, is good your thinking is good in strange and confusing times <laughs> really also, you can get the natokinase, stay, still get the natokinase at drdrew.com slash TWC and get a discount. All right. Hang on here. I'm uh, trying to get everyone up here. This is Englewood, DJ Englewood. Get him in here. DJ, you unmute yourself there. There you are. Mm -hmm. It muted again. That's weird. Just hit that microphone in the lower left-hand corner with the line through it. There you are. Try again. Oh, gone again. Mike Fish giving the thumbs down. Uh, all right, Mike, we'll get you up next. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now let's see if you can do any better, my friend. Do, do, mm -hmm. do, 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 hey, Dr. Drew. Mike. Am I on? Hey, man. You're on. Hey, We've talked before on other episodes. I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Quick question. From the medical community's perspective on an international uh, scale, because obviously these vaccines are, are, are useful not only for our country, for, me, for much of the population, or I should say some of the population, but I'm sure there has to be a consensus mm -hmm. that isn't really politically driven. What do they, yes. you know, on an international scale say about this? And and how corrupt is, is that board, I guess? Well, there there is no international board, but but the international consensus is exactly what I'm presenting, that elderly people have a lot to be gained. The risk profile seems to be somewhat less for some reason in the elderly, and they will not give it for anybody under the age of 50. They will not allow it. They will not, you can't get access to it in Scandinavian countries, for instance. So why are we pushing? Uh, and Dr. Bhattacharya brought up the possibility that there's this weird continued hysteria that we uh, are going to somehow eliminate COVID from the world, which is never going to happen. So that notion in and of itself is just completely flawed and false. Uh, so what is it we're doing by putting young people at risk? I, it's just so uncanny. That's why. That's where witch hunts come from. When things, hey, something Dr. is happening, and, hang a second, Josh. And when something is happening and people can't explain it and it doesn't seem right and it scares them, they start looking for somebody to be the one doing it. But sometimes there isn't a someone. There's not a witch out there. Typically, there's not a witch. Listen to Mark Chankese. He's a cognitive psychologist. talks about this stuff all the time. Josh, what's up? Not much. Uh, so I just want to talk about the mental health aspects of this in the sense that narcissism in medicine, we know that's where narcissists go for the most part, because they have that kind of power. They have that kind of prestige. They, they're looking for that, that and also celebrity culture, but not everyone can be a celebrity. So medicine is a place where you can have that kind of control. And I'm wondering if we're starting to see a little bit of that pull out and say, this is a medical expert, but he's also maybe narcissistic. Or this is a, a top a person top in their field, but they're not really empathic for the other. Because a lot of this stuff right. has to do with empathy. What are the effects of my right. decision? You know? Right. Yep, so I just I wanted agree. to know, and, like, uh, where do you draw the line, you know, between uh someone well, who's healthy? Well, no, no. 
Now, hold on. So for for certain, you know, nar there's a reason narcissism, narcissism exists in the human population, because there are survival advantages in certain situations. You want narcissists that are fighter pilots. You want narcissists that are extreme athletes. You want narcissists that are surgeons because they are asked to take to take on responsibilities and risk that that they need to feel omnipotent in order to do effectively. Now, the question you're bringing up is uh, are is it also attracting narcissists to these leadership positions? like at heads of administrations and public health. And uh, I would say based on uh, observations of recent behavior, you're, you're onto something there, that that, that that is probably the case. Uh, and you're right also that lack of empathy, but lack of concern for the consequences of their action is really, they're, they're, again, there's a grandiosity embedded in, in narcissism that makes it um, difficult to be assessing the risk reward of what you what you've done so there's a lot a lot to all this there's a lot to it i'm gonna try to bring dj back up whoops jeez that is not working uh let me try oh hey my goodness try to bring janice up here and try to do that hmm this is interesting well, it seems to, I, I seem to have uh, exceeded my phone's ability to, uh, let's try, no. Maybe Caleb can do it. No, it's okay. Wait, which we, person? we are out of time. And, and it, oh, oh yeah. come on. Well, I was trying to get Janice or DJ Englewood, I think he is up there, but uh, both of them bounce out when I try to uh, get them up to the speaker's podium. Um, so be that as it may, uh, we are we are about out of time in any event. As, as always, uh, I, I just think it's... Uh, worth everyone's time to listen and pay attention to what Dr. Bhattacharya has done, is doing. He, in my humble opinion, is the poster child um, for for the excesses and the... And when we, I, I Honestly, I just really feel in my gut that when the history books are written, this, this guy's picture will be there as somebody who was... Oh, for sure. ...who was not just correct but was was had the courage to stand up was correct was vilified for being correct and then was the object of a of a censorship campaign specifically designed to take away his first amendment privileges this is historically significant now jay uh, excuse me aaron cariotti i don't know why i don't think that aaron is quite the same as jay in terms of uh, being the uh, poster child but he should also be a poster child uh, let me tell you Aaron's story. Aaron is one of the other co-defendant in the Missouri versus Biden. And Dr. Cariotti is a psychiatrist who is a, a decorated professor of psychiatry at University of California, Irvine Medical School. He was the chairman of their bioethics department for years. And when the school started mandating vaccines, he raised his hand and said, look, I've been telling you all for years that you have to Walk the walk when it's difficult. You have to go up against authority sometimes when it's ethically appropriate and important. And I'm here to tell you, you do not have an ethical standing for mandating a vaccine, so I must object. He was immediately put on leave, and then he was silenced and fired. Uh, and he ha writes a, uh, a letter. You should look for it. Um, let me see if I can find it very quickly. Um, but he writes a, a, a regular sort of newsletter. If I go to all mail, give me one second here, and then I'll wrap this thing up. Cariotti, there he is. Um, the newsletter is called, oh, I'm so sorry. It's. I feel like it comes into my email all the time well now it's not here so in any event it's k-h-e-r-i-a-t-y cariati aaron a-a-r-n take look for it uh his newsletter i don't know why i can't come up with it but i'm sorry that i don't uh, one more one more shot i'm gonna look right here really quick okay i might find it here no. All right. Well, thank you all for being here today. Tomorrow, uh, we are away, but we have uh, on Tuesday at a, a special time, 1 o'clock Pacific, Rob Schneider coming in here. So uh, we are going to revisit a New York Times article that uh, vilified he and I for having a conversation about some of the excesses that were going on in 2020. 
Uh, Kelly comes back with Dr. McCullough and then uh, Michael Turner on the 18th also with Dr. Victory. A lot of interesting guests on deck. I, I'm finding all kinds of interesting people I want to talk to. There, there are more people uh, raise. Uh oh, and then of course there's a baby countdown. If you look at the screen, Susan, uh -huh. this is hysterical. Oh, that yeah, is the baby. Another cute baby coming. A baby's coming, so we're going to be gone the week after it's that. It's the right? Caleb Nation baby countdown. <laughs> uh, schedule will change. Oh my change. God! Look at its little facey. Schedule will change. He's hanging on to the the umbilical cord. Look at that. It's yeah, like a monkey. The, the her pussy. foot is like all the way up in her face. You might see her foot down there too. She's oh, like that's her all foot. curled around. Yeah, there's a foot in there. And, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's why Wait, I, that's I'm gonna till the 25th. So yeah, but I'm gonna start letting people know so they know. Like, well, if we have a guest that's scheduled and suddenly the baby decides to arrive early, then at least they know yeah. where we went. Yeah. <laughs> so we're just everything. We're <laughs> yeah. still gonna be doing shows leading up to the baby and after. But J the, the sure. schedule just needs to be a little flexible in case she just decides She's to pop on out. The schedule yeah. will change. What's her name? I ain't telling yet. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Okay. When, when she gets here. When she okay. gets here. Okay. Uh, the schedule will change uh, based on uh, baby and delivery dates. and uh, Baby much, A. <laughs> yeah. And we got to give um, Caleb a chance to adjust to all this before oh we go full swing. Oh, my God. But, but we do have lots of great guests. I keep – what I was saying before we went into baby countdown was – I continue to find people that are raising their hand and going, um, I have a question. And then these people are substantial. They're, they're leaders in the medical community. And as soon as they raise their hand, I want, I want to talk to them and understand what, what's your concern? Why are you concerned? Why, what, what's going on here? All right. Well, so everybody share if you care on whatever platform you're on and get the word out and keep this, this movement forward. We're moving forward with this. So. Do you want to talk about our friends at TWC too before we uh, head Thank out? Thank you to TWC for sponsoring the show and all the other great sponsors. Go to drdrew.com really do. slash sponsors. I really do love that uh, emergency kit. I, Get your emergency I, kit on. I'm and, beginning uh, to think, I'm beginning to develop a, a notion uh, that medicine needs to be way more accessible in the digital age. There should be no reason you shouldn't travel with a kit like that. I mean, that's just easily accessible. So doctor and check out all the other stuff they have to offer over there. Um, and then also thanks Primal Life for helping us teeth, keep our teeth clean and, and our sparkly. Marriage, and our marriage together. I laugh every time <laughs> yes. I see that thing. I, think I know. I, I couldn't turn off the, the toothbrush today and I sat on the counter. It was still running and I couldn't hear it. I was like, oh. oh. It's still on. And well, people think I'm kidding about that. No, no, no I love no. it. Oh, it's no. really quiet. She's been complaining because I always use a sonic. I've been convinced it's a my dad to use a sonic toothbrush. This is a great one. And it doesn't get all gucky because no, they have this good. cool it's little. It's good. They've got a great brush, great, and great the, product. The dirty mouth toothpaste is amazing. So, and, you know. All but right. But there's so many good sponsors. Go over to drdrew.com slash sponsors. Support the show any way you can. And um, thank you for listening and telling a friend. All right. Uh, and if you have, you know, like I always tell you guys, if you have a, a topic you'd like to propose or a guest like to propose, uh, contact at drdrew.com. Uh, send something in there. Susan looks at all that stuff and we'll, we will see it. So thank you so much. We'll see you with Rob Schneider on Tuesday, 1 o'clock Pacific time. Boop, boop. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. I have a question about this, Drew. Yeah. Um, so how much do you think that they are trying to advance medicine in terms of like pharmacy options, like in terms of medication you can take? Or how much are they just trying to like, well, we have Lexapro now, so let's push that and just deal with the side effects? The, or are they the, trying to develop things without these side effects? From the moment, this is how, how pharmaceutical research works. From the moment you pull a molecule off the shelf and identify it, you have t 10 years to bring it to market and profit, and then you lose the patent. 
10 years from the moment it comes off the shelf. On average, it takes five years and over a billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. So they are left with five years to make their profit. Then it goes generic and then it's pennies. So they only have five years with these drugs. So that, that's the only time they push them is during those, those years when they can make profit. And when there are new things that seem to have new benefits and seem to be better than previous things, doctors use them, even though they get a little more costly. But it, they have to recoup a, around somewhere between $800 million and $1.5 billion, depending on the drug. To, that's why this, the pharmaceutical industry is such a mess, because um, it costs so much money to do the phase three trials and get things through the FDA. Now, the the easiest thing to do is to take a drug you already have and change it a little bit and re retest it for you could do that in a couple of years, you know, you can get it through the FDA very quickly and that's why there's a million different Pepsid, Xanax, Tagamets, that's why there's a million different Protonics, Prilosex, oh, Nexium, the, because they're called Me Too drugs. That's the most profitable way because then you have eight or nine, seven or eight years to make your profits back. Uh, and usually it doesn't cost as much to get it to market. So that's why that happens. <laughs> 